Right, in this next section we're going to have a look at forced landings. Now forced landings really are what a glider pilot does every time they fly. But as a power pilot, I'm sure that it will certainly get the adrenaline going for real for you on the day that it happens. So what's different to a conventional aeroplane when you have a foot engine failure and a tiger moth? Well, one of the big bits, of course, is it's not your day. So after all of this, and everything that comes after this, I want you to remember one thing. Your prime goal is to fly the aircraft. So we're going to have lots of emotions going on. It's you're going to have maybe disbelief. You're certainly going to have a shot of adrenaline when it goes quiet. But the one thing I want you to remember is as soon as we have an engine failure and it goes quiet, the nose must go down to the gliding attitude, that really important gliding attitude that we've looked at before, and trim the aircraft. Once the aircraft's in the glide and trimmed out, then it's got a pretty good chance that you're not going to kill yourself in the initial stage of the accident. Because in reality, a lot of aircraft fatalities are caused by a loss of control of the aircraft in the early stage. If the aircraft is in the glide attitude and trimmed out, you're going to be busy from then on, and the aircraft, when it's in trim, will pretty well fly itself. So at least if we relax on the stick while we're thinking of other things, there will be a tendency for the aircraft to go into its natural trimmed 65 miles per hour glide, which is what we're looking for in a Tiger Moth. So what does the glide attitude look like? Well, it's like this. Can you see how the horizon cuts through the intersection struts about halfway up? The nose needs to be there or lower throughout the whole of the glide. So, having achieved the glide, our next thought is where are we going to land the aircraft? Now, obviously, wind may well be a really important factor. And if you remember back to your basic flying training, the sort of things that you're looking for in a good landing field is the five S's. The five S's are the size of the field, the shape of the field, the slope of the field, the surface of the field, and the surroundings. So let's have a look at each one of those factors. So, the aircraft's flying on and we're looking for our decent field. Where are we going to go? Well obviously the bigger the field, the better, providing that the other four S's make it a usable field. So big fields, generally good. Gives you more room for error. The shape of the field. Ideally, the length of the field wants to be orientated in the direction that's into winds, especially if there is a significant wind. If it's a ploughed field, then also the furrows want to be in the direction of the landing run, i.e. as close to wind as, wind as possible. So that's our size, our shape. The actual surface, as we say, wants to be uh, considered, if it's into crop, that's bad news because we're going to turn the aircraft over almost definitely onto its back as the wheels catch in the crop. So preferably the surface is going to be a grass field, uh, preferably not with livestock in it, or if there are livestock, they want to be right over to one side. We don't really want to be hitting cows at high speed. Bad news for the cow and bad news for you as well. But if you have to, that's the best field you go into. Grass is better, and if it is ploughed, as I said before, preferably landing in the direction of the furrow. The slope. Now, slope is very difficult to see, particularly from higher up. Ideally, the field wants to be flat. But if it does have some gradient on it, preferably we want to be landing up the hill. We don't want to be landing on a downhill slope because otherwise the ground may well drop away at exactly the same as our glide rate, our glide angle, and we may never, never even actually get to touch the ground, or if so it might put our glide way down the strip. So preferably flat or a little bit uphill. So what about surroundings? Well, surroundings are really important because a fairly short field, but with a clear approach, may be very usable. Conversely, a large field with very high trees or 200 foot pylons in the approach area is effectively going to render most of that field unusable. So the surrounding bits, particularly in the approach area, want to be uh, really carefully considered. Similarly, if you've uh, got pylons there, wires, and there's just like the slope which can be difficult to see, 
Wires can be very difficult to see from up above. So a good place to look for wires that you can't see will be the, either the pylons that support them. Big pylons are obvious. The smaller power cables that you see supplying farms can be much more difficult to see. So look for the wooden posts which may either be around the edge of the field or going across the middle of a field. So look for those posts and maybe the ground may have ring circles of uh, where the uh, tractor has been going around the posts to where the farmer has been going around them while he's ploughing the field or sowing it. They may help your eye to cue in to the obstacles. So having found our good field that's into wind we now know how to set up a pattern. Now obviously this all depends upon what height above the ground that you actually suffer your engine failure. To start with, we'll consider a fairly high level one at maybe 3,000 feet or 4,000 feet where you've got time to sort it out. So in the ideal world, we've picked our uh, field. We can now fly to it and pick up the force landing pattern. While we're going towards the overhead of the field to get to the high key position overhead the field, overhead of our touchdown point, then we can start thinking, why did the engine stop? So things that we consider is, is the fuel still switched on? Has the cock vibrated shut? Is there enough fuel quantity? Has somebody knocked the ignition switches off? It's, believe me, it's happened to me with a passenger knocking switches off. What about the throttle? Has the throttle come closed on you? Either because you've let the friction nut off or because the passenger's knocked it and closed the throttle. Good chance that one of those may help you. But if not, it's time to think about our landing checks. So we want to make sure that the fuel goes off, the ignition goes off, that we're strapped in nice and tight, and if you've got slats, that the slats are unlocked. We can put out a mayday call, because it will be a mayday if you've lost your engine, and all this is done while we're going towards the field. Now, we'll have a look and a talk through the force landing pattern. Initially, we're going to aim to touch down a third of the way into the field. So here's our airfield with the left wind from the left designated by the orange arrow at our initial aiming point a third of the way into the field. From high key, we fly the aircraft into wind in its landing direction. And it's during this point that if we haven't done them, our final landing check should be completed and the engine should give given a good at least three second warming blast. Once the initial aiming point lies above by the left or the right tailplane, we turn the aircraft through 90 degrees using 30 degrees of bank. We fly the aircraft at crosswind, and once we reach a point again where the initial aiming point lies midway between our wingtip and our tailplane, we can turn downwind routing towards low key, which is a beam, our initial aiming point. At low P, we can be anything between 1500 feet and 800 feet above the field. And it is from here that we pick up our constant sight line approach and towards the initial aiming point. Once the landing in the field is assured, we can bring our touchdown uh, point back towards the approach and hedge by either increasing our drag with side slip, lowering flaps if we've got them, or flying a slightly wider, longer finals turn. In the ideal world, the sightline angle should be continuous all the way around our approach, which means we're going to hit the IAP. Real life isn't like that. We may well find that we are actually going a little bit low. In other words, the field becomes flat in our view. At this time, we increase our angle of bank, therefore flying a shorter distance in towards the field and therefore getting back on the ideal constant sightline angle. Conversely, we might find we're getting high, and this is the time to reduce the bank angle and fly a longer ground track, designated here by the line with a long dash and a small dot. So we can adjust our angle into the field and our flight path by either reducing or increasing the amount of bank that we're using to put our touchdown point just in from the hedge. Here we are at Leon Soland and we're going to look at a constant sightline approach from low key. Paul shows us how it's done.
So here Paul is beam his touchdown point on the grass to the left of the main runway and he's continuously judging his sight line to that touchdown point and either increasing or decreasing the bangle of bank that he's using to touch down just into the grass strip. He thinks he's a little bit high here now so he's rolling out. This is a day with no wind so the aircraft has relatively good penetration but as he thinks he's near his back on the sight line he turns the aircraft in towards the touchdown point and you'll see how accurate he is at placing the aircraft just onto the grass strip. Of course if there was a hedge he would need to be considerably higher at this point. As the aircraft flares you can see the landing attitude with the horizon on the front strut. This is a touch and go so Paul opens the throttle up again, raises the tail to the takeoff attitude and climbs back up towards low key. So here we are again, we've climbed uh, through high key and we've just turned downwind towards low key. You can see the initial aiming point just forward and below of the front left strut. When Paul thinks he's a beam, the initial point, he's going to commence the roll in to his constant sight line final turn. You see Paul turned in quite aggressively and he thinks he's got a little bit high so he's now actually rolled wings level to bring him back down onto the correct sight line before he rolls in and has adjusted his touchdown point. The aircraft can be very accurately placed using this technique. And there's the flare. The good thing about the constant aspect approach bit is that we can join our finals turn at any particular stage either into the low key or into a base or in fact straight on into finals position. Remember it's always much better to land long and run into the overrun fence than it is to run short and fly through the approach end fence. So now we're going to have a look at some forced landings flown from low key at Exton Airstrip. And you can see that from low key the pilot's assessing where they are in the constant sightline approach and taking small turns at it and then rolling out and indeed rolling away from the airfield if they're high. And then when they assess their back on the sightline angle, turning back in towards the initial touchdown point. Now I must stress that for the initial aiming point, should be a third of the way down the strip. So here we come lining up, we're definitely going to make it onto the airstrip and now we've just got to look at flaring the aircraft on and making a smooth three-point landing. So that was a good one. Now let's have a look when it doesn't go quite so well. The pilot's a little bit close here, they're about uh, 700 foot above the ground, it's actually on high ground uh, with a rising strip in the direction that we're landing, it actually slopes up the field. So the pilots turned in, initially thinking that's where they need to be. We're aiming a third of the way up the strip. So the pilot thinks they're a bit high, rolling out and then rolling in again. And are we going to make a touchdown point a third of the way down the strip? Well yes we are here. However there is an end fence and whether we're fully stopped is questionable so for a practice the pilot's making a sensible decision and going around but that would have been a good approach with a good safe landing. So let's have the next one. Again the pilot's a little bit tight to the strip you can see the strip only about halfway between the fuselage and the interplane strut. We really want to have the touchdown area about on the interplane strut but they're widening out the downwind leg and passing low key now. Again our initial aiming point should be about a third of the way up the strip. So let's see how it goes. The pilot's turning in, starting that continuously curving approach for the sight line. And how do you assess the strip now? It's probably starting to go a little bit shallow, but the pilot's still not really turned in hard. And so it's still shallow here. And the pilot starts to make the basic error of stretching the glide. Don't shallow, don't shallow, no, no. 
the nose. Now flare, flare, flare. You won't be surprised to learn that last one finished with me fully opening the throttle and flaring the aircraft and cushioning it just in towards the start of the strip. So less than ideal. The pilot should have turned in tighter earlier. So here we go on the next approach and it's looking quite good here. The pilot's realising they're shallowing and they're tipping in. Again, a constant sight line. Are we going to make it into the strip? Ideally looking for a third of the way. We're not going to make a third of the way maybe, but we're certainly well into the strip. The pilot lines up and flares the aircraft into a nice three-point landing. A good one. Well, Sally Ann certainly seems to be pleased with herself having achieved that one, so we're going to climb away for one more. Take as many opportunities as possible to practice your force landings. If they don't go quite right while you're practicing, analyse what you could have done to have improved it and keep practicing. Remember that if there's changing conditions, different winds, crosswinds or headwinds, it all makes the picture look slightly different. So get, take the opportunity to practice whenever you can. Today is a calm day. In fact, there might have even been one or two knots of tailwind up the strip, but it's gradually rising nature to the west made this direct, approach direction preferable. You can see Sally Ann making the decision as to when to roll out and when to tip in a bit more to tighten the turn and bring herself round to assure a touchdown onto the strip. Now lining up onto the centre line and looking for the flare point. Notice the nose attitude is still down all the way into the flare. And she keeps ruddering the aircraft to keep it straight in the middle of the strip. While talking of that attitude, I'm just going to replay that clip to have a look at the attitude once more. Attitude controls your airspeed, so maintain that glide attitude all the way down to the flare. Do not be tempted to raise the nose to stretch the glide. It might be better to actually lower it and fly into ground effect and then hop over a fence if you're desperate. So, as I said, the secret is to practice in as many different conditions as possible. For those of you who haven't flown a biplane before, and are only used to monoplanes, you'll find that the Tiger or Moth series are incredibly draggy compared with what you're used to. Their descent angle will be much steeper, and certainly if there's any headwind, that will also make the approach much steeper. Always aim for a third of the way into the strip. You can roll away and extend your final approach path, or sideslip the aircraft to lose height. Conversely, if you find yourself going low, then your options are limited, but there are a couple of things that you can do to help yourself. First of all, make sure you're flying the aircraft in balance and at the correct speed. Do not be tempted to raise the nose and stretch the glide. In fact, if you are undershooting slightly, you might find yourself better lowering the nose, descending the aircraft down into ground effect, and that way it will actually fly further than if you extend the glide and fly the aircraft below its minimum drag speed. The great thing about it is you will have high air speed, so therefore you'll have good control authority with good airflow over the controls and good lift. That may well be sufficient to float you over the end fence and onto your landing area. At some really busy airfields, it can be difficult to actually get in time into the circuit to practice your force landings. But try and seize a quiet period, often at the end of the day when everybody's got home is a good time. It's this last bit from low key round to the touchdown that really takes the practice and needs it. To often you won't be high enough to route anywhere other than directly to low key for your chosen landing site. So practice as much as you can in as many conditions as you can. It's this skill that where you may well save your skin one day. If you fly old aeroplanes long enough, the engine will stop on you. So be ready for it. And after all, practicing force landings is good fun anyway. Now to uh, an engine failure that may well be a lot more difficult to deal with, but will have give you significantly less time. And that's the case of the engine failure after takeoff. A horrible situation at the very best of times. However, we can plan and help it slightly 
in that before every takeoff, having done our before takeoff vital actions, if we take just 30 seconds to stop and think before lining up, where are we going to go if and when the engine stops during the takeoff roll? And undoubtedly, that will be a di or there will be different solutions to that at different parts of the takeoff. So initially, you may be wanting to put the aircraft back onto the runway or the strip. Beyond that, there may be fields beyond the airfield itself. Think which way you're going to go, which way is the wind. And then your options may change as you get higher up. To give you an idea, we're basically looking to land the aircraft within 45 degrees of the nose, either way, if you lose your engine on takeoff. Whatever you do, do not be tempted into a turn back. Remember, the Tiger is a lot more draggy than a conventional aircraft. Its rate of descent, or angle of descent, will be significantly steeper. If you do successfully manage a turn back from higher up, remember also that having touched down, you're going to be travelling much faster than you would if you were landing into wind. Let's think of that. If we're climbing out at 65, suddenly at 150, 200, 200 feet, the engine goes quiet. We lower the nose, trim the aircraft out. And we can land straight ahead into a 15 knot breeze and our touchdown speed is going to be in the area of 30 miles an hour over the ground at stall speed. Conversely, if we lose the engine higher up and say we're at 400 feet, 500 feet and we're tempted to turn back onto the airfield. Now, our stall speed is still 45 miles an hour but we've got 15 miles an hour tailwind. So even if we successfully make the airfield, we're going to have a minimum, minimum touchdown speed of 60 miles an hour, as opposed to 30 miles an hour. Not only that, your landing roll at 60 is going to be considerably longer on the ground than it would be at 30. And therefore, at all that time during the roll, that landing roll, you've got more chance of hitting something, coming off the edge of the runway, turning the aircraft over, there's much more energy involved in the machine. And that's why the Air Force always teach land ahead. In fact, even in the modern tutors, they teach that there's no turn back below 600 feet. So if it's good enough for the Air Force, I suggest it's good enough for you and me. Just to give you an idea of how absolutely vitally important it is to lower that nose and land ahead, here's a clip of film. It's not pretty. People paid the price so that you and I can learn and remember the lesson, but I think it makes the point well. Death of a pilot and his female assistant in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. She was standing on the wings of the Tiger Moth when it suddenly lost power. We warn, this report may upset some viewers. In high spirits, the stunt woman and the pilot were taped by an amateur cameraman just minutes before the crash. The experienced aerobatic team were preparing for a display, an air show put on especially for a group of teenage cancer victims. You think you can fly? Seconds after takeoff, the engine sputtered and stalled. Trying to pull his craft around to land, the Tiger Moth ditched before the crowd. It exploded on impact, the light wooden canvas plane engulfed in flames. The heat forced rescuers back, the woman died, the pilot survived with 100% burns. He was rushed to hospital but died late this afternoon. The woman wing walker was a coordinator of Canteen, a voluntary group that organises getaway trips for terminally ill children. They knew the person, both people quite well. Right, so how close were some of them? I think just friends really, I don't, no relations, just friends. It was the second year the pilot and his stunt partner had entertained the children. The camp group has been taken to Maitland where they'll be counselled. Michael Usher, National 9 News. Right, so having seen that absolutely harrowing piece of film, What's the solution when the engine fails at low level? Fly the aircraft, lower the nose, trim the aircraft, land somewhere straight ahead within 45 degrees. Here's a graph showing the increase in stall speed relative to your angle of bank. I know it's slightly out of focus, so I do apologise, but it was the best I could rip from the net. And as you can see, if you look along the bottom row, and we're going at say 45 degrees, the stall speed has increased by about 20%. If you go along the bottom again to 60 degrees, so you'll be pulling 2G there, the 
stall speed increases by 40% and once you're up to 75 degrees the bank then you're increased to well over 100%. So if we're going to start increasing the bank angle then we need to increase our speed to maintain a sensible safe margin over our stall speed and for that reason we shouldn't put on more than 45 degrees of bank and that's really the reason why that tiger moth started to spin it got slow stalled with yaw and hence spun so here's another clip of film of exactly the same sort of thing happening but being dealt with i would suggest in a much better way and certainly with a much better outcome So there you see, two ways of dealing with a low level engine failure. Not good news for the cow in the second piece, but very well dealt with and an excellent outcome for the crew. So when you take off the next time and start in that throttle, I suggest that it might well be worth having thought that 30 seconds before you do it. So what am I going to do when the engine quits? Because one of these days it will quit on you. At slow speed or at high weights, the moths need careful handling to avoid spinning. But as you can see, once you've got some speed, and here with the aircraft fairly light, Dave Phillips flies a beautiful aerobatic sequence with the Tiger Moth. So take a quick break and enjoy his aerobatics before we finish off the subject of force landings. Of course, having actually got the aircraft to touch down in the right part of the field, then the journey's not over and the force landing's not over until you completely come to a halt. So do not relax with the fact that you're down. Keep steering the aircraft and flying the aircraft exactly the same as you would on an ordinary conventional landing. Once you've come to a halt, that's the time to make sure that everything's switched off and vacate the aircraft. Unfortunately, if the aircraft has been bent during the landing roll, well, that's bad news. But remember, the important bit about a forced landing is to save the lives of you and your passenger. If you've done that, then bravo. But now might be a good time to stick in your phones the number for the accident investigation folk. So put it in your mobile now. It is this number. I hope you never ever have to use it. It would normally be appropriate then also to just make contact with the police and let them know what's happened and also with the local landowner and the operator of the aircraft if it's not your aeroplane. Now if you fly these aircraft enough, sometime or other, you will suffer an engine failure. I've had two in my uh, time, one which was self-induced doing aerobatics at high level and a uh, passenger put it into a rather more vertical stall turn than what I'd liked. I grabbed it and said I'd, I have control, really meaning of course that I didn't have any control at all, but I thought I'd rather like to. The engine stopped during the top of the stall turn and it was a fairly new engine and despite getting the aircraft up towards VNE, we couldn't restart it. Fortunately, we started at over th three and a half, four thousand feet, so we're still above three thousand feet. And here comes a really useful lesson that if you're going to go and do aerobatics, before you start, make sure that you've selected a field underneath that's suitable while it's all calm. You can do this while you're climbing up. While you're climbing up, you have a good look around, pick a suitable field. If all goes wrong, that's the one you're going to use. 
I know several people who've had various things go wrong with their aircraft aerobatting and have not done that and the aircraft's got bent. So every time you go up, it's a simple thing, we're going to do aerobatics in the climb, I'm overhead a decent field that I'm going to put the aircraft into. The second engine failure I had was a much lower level than that. I was just climbing out of Sandown airfield on the Isle of Wight over a ridge, got to probably about 800 feet, but it's quite high ground there, and it was probably only about 300 feet above the edge of the ridge, uh, slightly displaced to the side, and suddenly the engine went quiet. So it was down with the nose, no time to think about it, there's the wind, there's a field, round into it. It was actually had a bit of a slope in it, going down. So the aircraft took quite a long time to actually slow down and it was into fairly long grass so it really did need the stick hard back and continue to rudder and keep that aircraft as straight as possible during the rollout. I can assure you that it certainly gets the adrenaline going but do not relax until the aircraft comes to a complete halt. Fortunately that was a carburetor issue which was easily solved and the aircraft was flying again later that afternoon. The next consideration we have is a, an engine failure during the circuit. Now quite a lot of airfields have circuits that uh, are pretty built up and maybe small fields around them. So I put it to you that we're only flying from most modern airfields, people fly enormous circuits and here's a really good reason not to fly enormous circuits. Flying a military oval circuit, from the downwind position you can actually land the aircraft back onto the airfield. But when you consider the enormous circuits that are flown at most civilian airfields, that option is not available to you. So the next time you're flying some circuits at your home field, have a good look out and pick the fields that you're going to use at any stage of the engine failing. Remember, it's much better to be doing that while the engine's running than at the moment it actually all goes quiet. So if you are aerobatting, it's always nice to know that there's a good landing strip right underneath you.